Hello, this is uh, Arend Langetink from the Netherlands and I thought I'd make a video to explain to you how um, Sten Meyer's uh, car on water, how it actually works. Um, let me first tell a little bit about myself. Uh, I studied electrical engineering here in Twente at the university and I hold a master's degree in electrical engineering. Um, well, during my study of course uh, I had did many courses on uh, physics like uh, quantum mechanics and uh, electrical fields, all that kind of things, uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, I grew up on a farm. Um, my, my, my favorite uh, tractor is the MF35. I hope uh, to own one in the future, but that's a little bit beside the point. Um, so after, after my study, I, uh, I worked as a, a software engineer and worked uh, among others on a program called uh, Open Detect, which is used in uh, uh, explore, exploration uh, for gas and oil, and it, it visualizes uh, seismic data, that kind of stuff. Oh, and uh, at a certain point, I became interested in uh, alternative uh, energy. I saw a video about uh, car and water. Ha ha ha! It's impossible. Everybody knows that law of conservation of energy. But somehow I got uh, got interested and um, I studied a lot of lot of material. Uh, first, the first ones which I thought was very interesting was uh, Tom Bieren. He talked about don't kill the dipole. And, and well, it was when I saw his videos, it was directly clear that this was a guy who uh, knew what he was talking about, or at least uh, it wasn't uh, like a. Um, uh, some 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 lunatic which has no no idea what he's dealing with. Uh, at some point, I also discovered Eric Dollard, um, which is basically uh, almost a legend already in uh, in the alternative research uh, um, field. Uh, what he did, he uh, he re replicated a lot of um, experiments did, done by Nikola Tesla, and uh, Nikola Tesla well was really a genius. And he basically invented the uh, 20th century. He gave us the uh, dynamo, the electric motor, AC power, uh, radar, radio, uh, the fluorescent tubes. I mean, all, almost the whole basic uh, electrical uh, engineering stuff, Tesla invented it. I mean, of course there are lots of other guys who did great things, but Nikola Tesla is is really the greatest scientist uh, ever lived on this planet. And well, one of, one of the things what uh, Nikola Tesla um, taught or teached was the importance of the eater. Uh, he was very much against uh, Einstein's relativity theory. And he was very, very clear about that. Uh, one of the things was uh, when you have, when you have space and it's, it's curving, that means that uh, nothing can uh, uh, short of uh, ex uh, forces can be exchanged by matter and nothing because space is empty, it's nothing, and still apparently particles react to uh, contracting or expanding space. And so, well, that's impossible. It uh, um, it violates the law of conservation of energy, and it does, of course. So at some point I also looked at uh, the very foundation of our theories and one of the most important uh, equations we have in electrical engineering are the Maxwell equations. And they describe the uh, electric, electromagnetic fields uh, and they describe them as being caused by charge, charge carriers. Um, and at some point I realized, hey, we know from the uh, very famous dual slit experiment that particles are electromagnetic waves. So there's a circle resonation, a circle uh, logic, a chicken, egg, a chicken egg problem in the Maxwell equations because the Maxwell equations say, hey, the fields are caused by matter, charge carriers, while from the other side we know charge carriers, matter, are nothing but electromagnetic waves. So there's a bit of an error in there. And I discovered the work of uh, Dr. Ch uh, Charles Kenneth Thornhill, and he described well, 
if you remove remove charge carriers, as charge or current as the sources for electromagnetic waves to exist, and uh, so you you only take the uh, the dynamic part, the, the changing parts, then you can describe the electromagnetic waves without the need for the Lorentz transformation. Um, so um, that means that. The whole Einstein theory, which is based on the Lorentz transformation, is not needed anymore, and you can return to an ether theory. So that's all very exciting, of course, on the, on the theory part. Um, but I wanted to explain how Stanley Meyer scale works. Um, so there have been a number of uh, discoveries or uh, results uh, in the scientific world uh, having to do with cold fusion. What they do with cold fusion is they have a um, two well an, an anode and a cathode, so two plates of um, uh, matter, iron, uh, metal, and they create a plasma around one of the, those electrodes. Uh, it can also be a, a spark gap with with water or vapor around it, and then you get interesting things. You get more energy out of the system under certain circumstances than the amount of energy you put in. Uh, using electric current. So, how is that possible? You have to have an energy source in order to get extra energy. So, uh, this, this whole uh, cold fusion idea and uh, uh, well, it was basically a well, we could call it a storm in the in the scientific world. It happens in the in the 1980s and so. Some people measured excess energy and they didn't know where it came from, so it has to come from somewhere. So that must be a fusion, nuclear fusion, that must be the answer. So they went on uh, on a search for how, for the answer of well, where does the energy come from. And finally in 1989 uh, the United States Department of Energy organized a special panel to review the cold fusion theory, theory and research. And in their report, they concluded that the results, uh, as of that day, did not represent convincing evidence that useful sources of energy would result from phenomena attributed to cold, cold fusion. They noted a large number of failures to replicate excess heat and a lot of inconsistency of reports of nuclear reaction byproducts. So basically, they said, well, it's very hard to reproduce, it's not um, consistent. And they concluded, well, New, the byproducts we, we see, which you would expect from a nuclear reaction, well, they're not there. That's the basic. So, still, there are a number of reports, uh, or a uh, number of uh, papers, you can find them on my website, about uh, strange uh, uh, explosion, uh, explosive power when you have an, an, a water, uh, an arc, so uh, a plasma in water, it explodes and it, it also gets more energy out than you would expect. So there, there we have two, uh, two, two foundations or two experiments basically which suggest hey there, there's something going on I and mean, it's not for nothing that, that, that almost 10 years cold fusion was uh, a hot item in, uh, uh, in, in the scientific world. Then okay so when we look at what Stan Meyer did, uh, he had he had a water capacitor, basically two pipes of uh, stainless steel, one a little bit bigger than the other, in, in, so it's, it's concentric, and he put uh, puts electric pulses on them, and he managed to drive his uh, VVW car for four years on this uh, system, allegedly. And, um, he also continued development uh, more advanced systems like uh, uh, water injectors, which would uh, were to replace the um, uh, spark plugs of a normal engine. So the link between uh, cold fusion experiments and what he did uh, is there, or perhaps there. Um, after uh, Stanley Meyer uh, passed away. He apparently got, uh, he had a, a very bad uh, case of uh, food poisoning uh, 
I don't know much about it, but he's not with us anymore. Um, and that happened, I think, in 1996, 1995. And since that time, we got four replications of his, his, his simple fuel cell. Uh, the first one is by Dave Lawton in, from the United Kingdom, uh, some guy called Ravi from India, and then we got uh, Mr. Crampton from the US, a doctor, and we got Bob Boyce who ra uh, made uh, race uh, uh, boats running on uh, water fuel. And all of those have, a, have some characteristics that explain how they were able to get more gas, uh, water gas out of the system than you would expect from the amount of current, from the amount of electric energy um, being put into the system. And especially Ravi and Lawton, they, uh, they made very clear that there is, has to be a conditioning process for, for the pipes. So their stainless steel pipes, there has to be a layer on top of them which is uh, not conductive and which has to be formed with a very sensitive process over well, a number of months actually. And so, what do we got with such a system? Oh, we essentially have an electrolytic capacitor. So yeah, you have one plate, which is an actual capacitor plate, and you have another plate, which is a, nothing but a contact plate, and on top of the positive plate, I know you have a very thin layer of the electric material. And the other capacitor plate is the fluid in between the real capacitor plate. So the ions move towards the uh, dielectric layer and because the, this, the, the thickness of the dielectric layer is very thin, you can get a very large capacitance. So uh, the idea of so the, the, the electrolytic capacitor works because the dielectric is very thin, and so the plate distance is very, very thin. And there are a number of interesting uh, observations have been reported uh, with electrolytic capacitors. Uh, first, uh, one of the things that has been reported is that um, when you charge these capacitors with uh, Bedini uh, chargers, which essentially uh, charge the capacitor with a full high voltage spike, so it's a very high voltage, for very very rising, uh, ste very steep rising edge, and then drops drops down much more slowly. Um, so a capacitor which is made for like 10 volts or something and the, when they are charged with those spikes which can go up to maybe a kilovolt or something. Then a very interesting, interesting phenomena uh, happens. Uh, normal when you have an electrolytic capacitor and you charge it to say 10 volts and then you shortcut it very shortly and then after maybe a minute or so you measure the voltage then there's one volt, one volt about uh, about one tenth of the original voltage is out, yeah, gets gets back. But that effect is called dielectric relaxation. So that's a, a known uh, effect in electrical engineering. But when you charge these capacitors with Bedini's uh, charges, so they're very steep uh, uh, pulses, high voltage pulses, this effect is um, much much stronger. So that strong that the capacitors will automatically recharge to. Uh, 10, 20 volts uh, even. So that, that's a very interesting effect so because you get capacitors which are recharging with without any, any energy, obvious energy source. How is that possible? Another interesting effect is also with the Bedini chargers. And Bedini, and John Bedini uh, as well as Aaron Murakami, they reported that uh, when they charge batteries, Lead acid batteries with those uh, chargers, they cold boil for up to an hour, an hour after they shut down the power supply. So, how how is that possible? I mean, you you have an otherwise normal battery. You you don't you charge it a different way with those high voltage spikes. You get you get the same effect that with an electrolytic capacitor which you charge with this high voltage, namely that it. It keeps on charging after you remove the charger, and with these batteries, you get uh, the production of HHO gas, or I use that as an abbreviation. It's not really, it's 
some people believe there is some kind of uh, strange gas. I, I use HHO as an abbreviation for um, hydrogen oxygen gas. So the normal uh, stuff which is uh, used all over the place like for the space shuttle and stuff. So, um, so this, these batteries from John Bedini, they produce uh, HHO gas um, up to an hour after they shut off the charger. And it is also reported that uh, something changes on the, the plates of the, uh, of the batteries. There's a different layer on top of these batteries than compared with a normally charged battery. So, okay, I guess, well, it must be a dielectric layer and it must be po polarized because that's... Uh, a dielectric is a material which can be polarized and then it, it, it uh, emits an electric field. It, it, you can do that more or less permanently. Um, and then these are used in uh, electric, it's called an electric then, and it's used in, uh, amongst others, in electric microphones. So it's a very interesting phenomenon uh, because you have an electric field which uh, is sustained from nothing and for a very long time. It's very comparable to a magnet, and that's why it's called an electric. Uh, so a magnet, it's 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 an, it's an um, um, taken together electric magnet, electric. So we have with uh, a dielectric material, we have the possibility to make an electric field, which um, which which which. Well, all we have to do is polarize the dielectric, and the polarization of a dielectric is uh, dependent on. The applied electric field. So when you have a dielectric, you apply an electric field on, over it, then it gets polarized. The stronger the field, the more it gets polarized. So when you think back to Bedini's high voltage pulses, you get momentarily over your um, dielectric on your electrolytic capacitor as well as on your um, battery plate, you get a very strong electric field for a very short moment of time but it very strongly polarizes the electric and thus you get a uh, relatively strong electric field in the fluid. And that is a very interesting um, uh, phenomenon because when you make the electric field inside the fluid very strong, you get inside the weather you get a process known as dielectric breakdown. And, uh, we, we can watch that uh, every now and then out in the, uh, in the, uh, in the environment and, and it's called lightning. But you, those same uh, tree-like, uh, spark-like thingy things, which is, uh, caused by, uh, which is called lightning, also appears inside, for example, water when you apply a very strong electric field. So when you look back to the um, cold fusion, uh, which, which creates a plasma, because it basically take two uh, wires and put a high voltage on it, and on one on the on the positive wire you get you get uh, plasma, you get this lightning. The problem is that uh, you have to have to deliver cons considerable amount of current in order to uh, to maintain the plasma. Still, you get excess energy. Um, it is conceivable that because of the plasma and um, the dielectric breakdown in water, you, you, can, you first generate HSO gas, which then, because the high temperature, uh, burns, and so that creates the um, excess energy in cold fusion. Nothing to do with fusion, but okay. That's, the, that's, that's what, uh, it's the same energy source, it's the electric field. So when we put one on one together, and then we look at what Stan Meyer did, well, we essentially have cold fusion, quote unquote, in practice, with a very efficient uh, uh, apparatus, which has been shown to work not only by himself, but with no less than four replicators. Um, still, we have the same question to answer: Where does the energy come from. 
And uh, the answer to that question is actually uh, has been found a few years ago by uh, the German professor Klaus Turtu. And he published a paper uh, about the conversion of vacuum energy into classic mechanical energy. Very, very interesting paper. Uh, he also, um, uh, what, what he described is, is he, he goes back to Coulomb's law. So that's, that's the, uh, the, 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 the electrostatic uh, law of um, the Coulomb, which, um, which says, well, well, you have a, a charge here, it has an electric field, and then you can measure with a, uh, another uh, point charge, a measurement charge, you can measure a certain uh, force. And this force is uh, proportional uh, with the power of uh, the quadratic power of the distance. So if the distance is twice as big, the force is twice uh, four times smaller. So that is that is the basic uh, formula for the static electric field. Now you can say, well, the static electric field, yeah, well, what, 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 what is that? Um, is it really something static that when you moment you have a charge here, you automatically within uh, it, it has so the, 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 the force and the field is spread all over into space within uh, zero seconds or so, uh, it's, uh, with an infinite speed? Or would we say, well, perhaps it has a finite a propagation speed, perhaps the speed of light? Actually, it's square root uh, three times the speed of light. But okay, it's just a factor of about 1.72. Anyway, um, so when you when you when you take this law of Coulomb and you say, well, this energy is spreading with the speed of light, as uh, Tutu assumes, then there is it has a certain energy density, and the energy is spreading out from from the charge. And what, what Tutu did, he calculated um, an integral, so you take a, a small sphere around a, a point charge at a certain time, so this, the field starts at the point charge, propagates at a certain speed, and in a, in a very short um, sh sh shell, very, very thin shell, you can calculate the energy density of that shell. And you can also do that at the moment Later, what he discovered is that this energy a moment later is less than the energy uh, close by. This means that the propagating fields give off energy to something somewhere. Well, we can call it the vacuum, you can call it the ether. But the point is, every charged particle in the universe emits electric energy, which is given away to space, the vacuum, whatever you want to call it. I like the eater a bit. And so then you get the same question, the guys uh, with the uh, um, uh, cold fusion uh, experiments uh, uh, got themselves into, which is the question, where does the energy come from? And well, if you have a, an electron or a, 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 an atom nucleus which emits an electric field, you know, it doesn't lose mass. It, well, where does the energy come from? There's only one way, one logical way possible, which is that, well, if you calculate that the emit, the, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the expanding fields give off energy to the, to the environment, to the ether, then of course, this energy can also be extracted from the ether by these charged particles. So you get a circulation of energy, and well, that that there is energy in the in the in empty space is also very very known in uh, particle physics. Uh, Tom Pearson also talked about that, and it's known as zero point energy. Uh, one of one of the uh, effects of of uh, this energy being present is that when you cool um, helium up to uh, uh, absolute zero and it won't freeze. It stays liquid because there is enough energy in the environment which keep this, uh, this, this, this uh, fluid in fluid state. It will not freeze. Another, uh, another example is the Casimir effect. 
So it's known that this energy is there. Well, we also know now that uh, charged particles emit an electric field with a finite propagation speed. So there is energy there. In other words, the electric field is an energy source. So when we make an electric field using a dielectric, we got ourselves a free energy source. And well, Tutor uh, showed this uh, he did, in his paper. There are many many measurements describes one of the one of the things what he did was he took, took a, a capacitor plate and a uh, on top of a water or just a metal plate, and he made a, um, a floating device with a rotor with, with, with some wings, and then he charge it with a very high voltage and you get new rotation without drawing any current. So this, this it's it's already a proof that the, the that electric field indeed does convert energy or charge carriers actually do convert energy out of the zero point field or the ether or whatever name you might prefer into electric field energy and then we can use it. In Tutor's case it was just well, it's a, it's a rotor and it's, it's very light, it, it rotates, but not really practical to use. In the uh, uh, cold fusion experiments, which are still uh, being performed, um, you have the same thing, but yeah, well, uh, the hydrogen is already is, is burned directly and there is the electric field uh, is maintained by an electric current and it takes a lot of energy and it's all messy and you, know, like, you don't want to do that. But when you look at what Stan Meyer did, he has two capacitor plates, one dielectric layer on top of it, like any normal electrolytical capacitor, and that's an insulating layer. There's no current going through an insulating layer. So all you need to do is maintain this electric field, maintain this polarization of this dielectric layer and you get an electric field for free which is an energy source. And if you make this field strong enough that you get the dielectric breakdown, as is being done with cold fusion, you get HAO gas, whereby the energy needed to produce the gas is extracted via the electric layer from the zero point field for free. And it's not a perpetual mobile, it's just application of an energy source which it has been identified, it has been known for years. It's just that we never uh, really uh, made the connection of the dots. The dots are all there. So now we know how it works. And that means we can uh, engineer a system. Because when we now we understand that the on the capacitor plates for an electroly uh, electro electrolyzer, you need to have a dielectric layer and you need to polarize it and you need to polarize it very strongly because you need to get water uh, to break down, you need to get dielectric breakdown in water and so that you get a, a very, you get the plasma, but it's a very uh, very weak plasma, maybe it's a good, good way to, to, to describe it. And one of the things that, uh, that you, you get such a plasma is with an uh, electrolytic rectifier, which has been, has been used for uh, well, decades maybe even by radio amateurs uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, around that era. Basically what you do is, well, in no, as a normal electrolytic capacitor, you use aluminum and uh, the electrolyte so in the water there is a, a salt. Uh, what you need to do is the aluminum. You need to grow the dielectric layer. It needs to be very thin and it needs to uh, withstand a certain voltage. So aluminum is one of the metals which is very suitable for electrolytic capacitors because if you have uh, a certain salt in your electrolyte or in your fluid, um, like baking soda for example, then uh, it, it grows a, a dielectric layer automatically. So when you take two plates of um, aluminum in a bath with baking soda and you connect a wire and a, a light bulb in series and you go directly to the mains, don't do this at home. <laughs> and the other side uh, you also go directly to the mains. 
so you get a you get an electrolytic rectifier and what's very interesting is that these things glow there's a there's a faint glow coming off of these um, yeah, capacitor or, or rectifier plates, which is of course a plasma. So we have a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence that with, um, first of all, um, a dielectric layer on a plate of metal, it can uh, it can produce energy because a um, electrolytic capacitor with a polarized dielectric layer on it. Uh, shows the di uh, dielectric relaxation effect and that can be amplified. Battery plates, batteries charged with Bedini's charger show the same effect. Also a dielectric layer is found on the battery plate and then they cold boil as in produce uh, hydrogen and oxygen gas for up to half an hour after you shut down the power. So the very strong polarization of the dielectric field is certainly possible within it with, well, it's just a car battery and the, and, the, and, the, and the coil and some, some, some electronics, so it's, it's really really very easy to do. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. so we have all the in ingredients, we know where the energy comes from, we know how to use it. It's, uh, so now it comes down for uh, the choice what dielectric should we use, what, what dielectric layer should we use in this what metals should be used and what electro electrolytes should be used. Uh, well, Stan Meyer used a, a stainless steel. It could be that he used a thing, a dielectric known as Delrin. It could also be that uh, you can uh, you can grow a suitable dielectric layer uh, electro uh, electrochemically. Uh, I have investigated a little bit in the theory about that, and one of the most promising uh, uh, electrolytes would be to use uh, uh, potassium hydroxide, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I don't use the, no, the correct English word. So potassium hydroxide, because that reacts with the nickel. And it's very interesting that uh, nickel is also used in uh, nickel cadmium batteries and, and it also uses uh, potassium hydroxide for the uh, dielectric or the electrolyte. So the uh, stainless steel version which has been used by uh, Meyer and uh, Crowton and oh, sorry Lauton but they all use stainless steel 316 which is the stainless steel with the highest nickel content it's about 10% nickel. So I would say that with, with a stainless steel you would want to use um, potassium hydroxide in your, um, in your water during the um, conditioning process in order to grow a dielectric layer. So then during, during the uh, usage, then all you need to do is keep this dielectric layer on one of the plates, the positive plates, very strongly polarized such that you have an electric field strength greater than the electric breakdown field strength of water, which is, from my head, I think it's about 70 kilovolts per millimeter. Uh, that seems a lot, and it is a lot, if you if you need if you have a plate distance of one millimeter, you need 70 kilovolts. But because the dielectric layer is very thin, you have like 70 volts over one micrometer. That's achievable, and I mean the evidence is there that it's achievable. So it really there there is there's no secret anymore. It's completely en engineerable, and so well, uh, yeah we I think we can uh, we can look forward to to a revolution in, in energy um, in, in energy systems because it's possible it has been done before we know how it works now so let's let's do it so um, well maybe uh, see you later I'll, uh, I'll I'll set put this on YouTube and uh, thank you for uh, for watching and uh, I'll I'll put uh, put a few references uh, down in the show notes well if you can call it a show either way uh, have fun uh, do whatever you like and uh, see you later